Welcome to Coffee House. Today is some of the most important stuff that we're going to talk about. I know I say that a lot, but this one especially is particularly important in the season that we find ourselves. I mean, the tenor of today's politics seems different. I think most people would be willing to say that. Hypocrisy is ignored. Rather than being a campaign-destroying liability, as it once was, there's no more shared goals and values talk. Now it's, if you vote for my opponent, you are destroying democracy. Community activist and political theorist Saul Alinsky wrote a book that might provide an answer. We thought we were participating in, in a democratic process when we were actually witnessing an attempted revolution. Rules for Radicals was originally published in 1971. It had another edition in 1989, I believe. And whether they know it or not, many, if not most, of the ardent activists today are animated by its principles. The only thing more concerning than its conclusions are the likely effectiveness of its prescribed methods. So as always, we will talk about the book, we'll go through the contents, we will have an analysis section wherein we talk about the good and the bad of the book, and then we'll do a big picture to kind of wrap it into a wider understanding of the world. So, of course, we are in the midst of election season, and so it made sense to review a book that called Lucifer the First Radical. First, he kind of talks about the youth. He suggests that in his youth and amongst his friends, it was few of them that survived the Joe McCarthy Holocaust, and he used the word Holocaust in reference to the McCarthy era. He said that most of the activists at the time were products of the middle class. They distrusted all institutions. The establishments at the time were suicidal. There was a feeling of death hanging over the nation. And to hear these kinds of possibly justified Jeremiads about, you know, the early 70s, just after the 60s, it does give you a kind of a, at least general reflections of what's going on today. So the author suggests that there's a new generation that he wants to create. And it's a generation that doesn't just see themselves as a piece of data, as, you know, the corporations see them. So at this point, I mean, there are quite a few things that are appealing about this narrative. And something that I've definitely been more against lately, and been questioning to a greater extent, is the inclination to reduce humanity to data points. And this is, seems to be a genuine point of contention for this author, is that he is, he's concerned about this, not just in the kind of neutered sense that a lot of people are today, but genuinely concerned about the possibility of human beings being reduced to data points. He references, uh, at the time he was referencing, he was actually talking about people on the left who were people who were expressing psychosis through their politics. They weren't actual activists. They were just engaging in the psychotic behaviors and suggesting that they were in service of their activism. So he decries that. He suggests that that's not the way to be doing things. But you will see as we go along that it's not a matter of the, the means that are being used, that there's some kind of moral concern about them. He suggests that you have to work inside the system, that you get to either complain, and he references people, he says that you can sit around and you can complain about how people are being mean or it's taking too long through the system or something like that, or you can get to the work of building power. You can organize and keep the pressure on. And the action, the actual results come from keeping that pressure on, keeping the heat on. And one of the things he cites at the time was Vietnam and how at the time it was finally becoming acceptable to say that the United States was wrong in how they engaged in this conflict. And so this was uh, one of the early steps in the ability to be able to engage in this kind of activism in the proper way. So there's a possibility of destruction always there in the act of creation. And this is a kind of aphorism that really is illustrative of his philosophy when it comes to just politics and activism and being an organizer. And Alinsky divides people into three general categories. So the, the haves, the have-nots, and the have-a-little-but-want-mores. So the have-nots are satisfied with the status quo, and they try to justify it at every turn, justify the status quo, because it's working for them. It makes absolute logical sense for them to support the status quo. The have-nots are trying to take it away because it's not working for them, so they want to change it. So the book itself is about how to create mass organizations to seize power and give it to the people to be able to fix it. And he references now ideas about equality. There are a whole bunch of things that he talked about when it comes to kind of bumper sticker slogans related to the things that you would do for the downtrodden. 
But in this, he suggests that uh, while a free society organizer, that the organizer has to be fluid. It's not a matter of standing on certain particular principles, no matter what. It's a matter of a kind of approach that suggests truth is relative. But I don't think that Alinsky is suggesting here, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Alinsky is suggesting that truth is actually relative, that there is no such thing as objectivity. I think he's suggesting that for purposes of activism, it's a matter that truth is relative, that you have to be able to bob and weave with uh, the kinds of punches that are going to come at you, and you can't be standing on or stuck to particular principles, whatever they are, that might inhibit your ability to win in this context, just for the sake of uh, some kind of moral absolutism. So, like I said, he goes into the haves and have nots and the have a little want mores. So, the have a little want mores are the middle class who are in between and do both go both ways when it comes to preserving the status quo or making things better for themselves. There are also the do nothings, which mix in amongst these groups, who will say all the honeyed words that are in support of revolutionary acts or inclinations, but they don't actually do anything to help. And a couple of things that he references here are the fact that most people fear adventure, and many will reject the idea that other people's wellness is tied to your your own. So the way that he describes this is that self-interest demands that you are your brother's keeper, and the example he uses is that if you have food and your neighbor doesn't have food, your neighbor might come over and kill you to get the food. (laughs) So it's in both of your interests to make sure that your neighbor also has food. And one thing that he emphasizes regularly throughout is that you have to look at the world the way it is, not how it should be. When it comes to the revolution itself, and this is one really interesting thing that he talks about, is having this kind of duality that's built into a person, into the the organizer, is that the revolution cannot be gray. So you can't have um, kind of mealy approaches to what you're trying to accomplish in the revolution, even if there's some kind of a, a logical reason to do it when you're evaluating reality or trying to figure out who did what and all that sort of thing. You can't be gray when it comes to the revolution. So Churchill, he references, I think it was Churchill, who said he would chase Hitler all the way to hell and speak favorably of Satan if it was necessary to defeat Hitler. And Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, and there were many times when it was necessary in a context to do things that were absolute or dangerous or authoritarian to be able to effectuate the thing that you were trying to accomplish. And one reference he uses, or an example that he uses, was that uh, somebody came to him at some point and suggested that they had opposition research on some candidate or somebody who was an enemy, and it suggested they liked boys. And so... They offered this opposition research and said you can use it in the campaign and destroy them and and win in that way. And Alinsky said that he rejected it. He said he didn't want to fight like that. He didn't want to get into the weeds in that kind of a campaign. But he said that if he was convinced that was the only way to win, then he would have used it. He would have used that opposition research and he would have gotten into into the trenches that way and gotten dirty to be able to win. The choice was he could either not use it and go home with my ethical hymen intact or win. And he used the phrase ethical hymen. (laughs) And then he goes into this discussion about ethics as being the ethics of means and ends and all these reasons that the means might be distasteful or rough or anything else, but the end is worth it. Victors write history. Killing is justifiable in self-defense. Stalin at one point suggested that if you don't have guns, then you use the process, you fight within the process, and try to win that way, but once you have the guns, then use bullets. And then he later suggests that Gandhi only used passive resistance because it worked in the context, that Gandhi certainly would have used the guns if he had that opportunity. And when when they gained power in India, they actually outlawed passive resistance, the same tactics that Gandhi used because they worked effectively. Those were outlawed once they got into power. There's a chapter, A Word About Words, where he talks about the power of words, such as the word power, and power is the dynamo of life. And the whole idea is that you shouldn't seed a bunch of ground when it comes to the words, like by not using particular words because they've been given particular meanings, and that it's our fault in perverting the use of particular words. And he actually quotes Nietzsche at this point, and I can't remember the specific quote, but I appreciate the quote of Nietzsche. (laughs) And he quotes Hamlet later, too, so... To explain this concept, he says that he was in a a discussion with somebody at one point, 
wherein the person said, asked, where do you stand on communism? And he answered, whose communists are they? And he decried the people, especially the United States and America and Americans, for trying to disguise their naked self-interest when others weren't willing to do so. So when it comes to the communists, you know, you could have the, the communists in the USSR or Russia. And you have communists in China, and whichever one serves your interests are going to be your communists. You're not going to stand on ceremonies or use your principles to say that, oh no, well we can't accept those uh, because of our principles. But for purposes of organizing, he's suggesting that, there, again, there's no allowing principles and things to get in the way of doing things that are going to support your naked self-interest. And he suggests that everybody does it, we just try to pretend otherwise. So organizers, what should they be? He gives a whole primer on what an organizer should be, what traits they should have. These include curiosity, irreverence, imagination, a sense of humor. And this was important in the discussion of him saying that you have to avoid being a true believer in anything. So humor, if you have a sense of humor, you the humor cannot absolutely accept any dogma. There's always going to be some resistance to that absolute acceptance of it. You also have to have an organized brain wherein you can use a rationality in pursuit of a rational world. You need multiple issues to keep in motion. So you always need many issues that everybody is working on. And this could have something to do with, and this is me talking, this could have something to do with the kind of carrying capacity of our neocortex, the how much we can maintain at one time that we've talked about before. If you have enough of those things, then you're kind of overloading that part so people have to tap into the reptilian hindbrain as a means for understanding what they should be doing. But multiple issues, this is something that he emphasizes over and over again, is you have to have multiple issues at all times. He wants you to be, as an organizer, a well-integrated political schizoid. So it's not that you are a true believer in any given side, it's that you can switch as you need to. You need to be able to be dynamic in the way that you approach these politics. And that you have to have a brain of two parts. You have the the action part of your brain, which is absolutely polarized. It suggests that you are committed 100% on your side and 100% you try to destroy the other side. But also you need the negotiator part of your brain, which is willing to compromise and willing to see the gray area when it's necessary. And he says it's very hard to actually do this, to have this partition in your brain. And communication, extremely important. And he goes through a number of examples where it was relationship first. You have to be able to establish a relationship to be able to have the proper communication about the proper issues with somebody. And he talks about Samuel Adams, who said that three to four people are going to be martyrs, but ten is too many. They're not going to be martyrs. People aren't going to be able to remember that many people. And you want to talk about specific experiences, things that actually happen that are tangible, not a bunch of abstractions when you're trying to convince people. And realize the fact that people use creative rationalizations. He recounts this event where he was talking to a number of, he calls them Indians, I'm assuming they're Native Americans. Although, like we've talked about before, that's not a great term anyway, because it's a reference to America Vespucci and, and, and America in general. But anyway, so I'll call them uh, Native Americans for our purposes. But So they, they were talking about how they were fishers, and they went fishing, and their fishing was so much different from the way the white man fished, and that's why it was so important. They use creative fishing, and Alinsky called bullshit, like literally said the word bullshit or something like that. He used profanity when calling it out. And the Native American said that, you know, all the other people that they talked to, the political organizers, would talk to them like children. You know, they would be, they would use kid gloves and, and be fawning and accept their rationalizations about this stuff, but he really uh, just drove it home to them and said, no, that's BS. So he suggests that when you're dealing with people like this, you have to treat them as rationalizers and you have to break through. So the process of power. The organizer breathes one thing, build mass power base. The first step in community organization is to disrupt community organization. You must change their routines. Whatever their routines happen to be now, you have to change those things to prime them from being able to do something else. You must search out controversy and issues. Search them out. Find as many as you can and have several going at any given time. You have to stir up dissatisfaction and discontent. To attempt to operate on goodwill instead of power basis would be the first time that worked in world history. So he suggests that you can't rely on goodwill. That's not how it works. You have to rely on your power basis to make sure that things are going to be accomplished. A single issue will strangle an organization. You have to have multiple issues, as we've talked about. People are hungry for drama in general. They want the adventure, so you just need to give it to them. 
the organization will give him his birth certificate for life. He talks about this, how somebody who joins the organization now as part of this, you know, nobody had asked him his name before. Nobody asked what he thought about anything before. And now he has, he's involved in something wherein that stuff matters, wherein he feels important. And you have to learn to respect the dignity of the individual. The individual, each of the individuals are very important. You have to respect the dignity of each one. Then there's this whole section on tactics specifically, which will, of course, make you shudder in the, in the way that you uh, would likely realize that these things probably work very effectively, but they are so devoid of any kind of moral foundation that it's one of those things that kind of chill, chill your humanity to the bone. So Hannibal, the uh, not the cannibal or the comedian, but Hannibal, the military general, suggested that we will either find a way or we, we will make one. So the power is not just what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Never go outside the experience of your people. Wherever possible, go outside the experience of your enemy, however. A tactic that drags on too long loses potency. You have to switch up your tactics a lot, because it not just loses potency with the enemy, but it loses potency with your own people. So you keep pressure on with different tactics. The threat of something is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. If you push a negative hard and deep enough, it will push to the other side and become a positive. And here's one of those things, this is one of those things that is so concerning, is that if you have a problem identifying the enemy, then that makes, it makes logical sense because things are actually complex. But you have to personify the evil. Whatever you're fighting against has to be personified. You have to find a target. There are a lot of people, would-be targets, who will try to pass the buck, and often justifiably do so. Say, it wasn't us, we didn't do that, that wasn't about us. But you have to identify a target. You have to pin it down rather than letting it be diffuse, just some kind of a, an abstraction that you have to attack. Use name names, quote figures. There's this one situation that he talked about wherein they went to this like town hall or something like that, and they were trying to get something accomplished, and he knew ahead of time that they could, they could have it, that they were going to get what they wanted that legally they were entitled to it and they were already guaranteed that they were going to get it. So when they got to this thing, they just kept yelling and kept yelling, kept interrupting the people who were trying to say, we're going to give it to you over and over and over again until they got to a point where they just demanded, are we going to get it, yes or no? And then the lady flustered just said yes, and they, then they screamed and all left. And so it was as if the things that they did was su were super effective, but in reality it was just a show. There's this idea of emphasizing tactics your people enjoy. There's this one tactic that was used, apparently, <laughs> wherein they were trying to disrupt, you know, kind of the higher class when when it came to uh, some kind of a uh, labor dispute or something like that. So there was the symphony orchestra that was planned, and he got tickets for a whole bunch of his activists to go to the symphony orchestra. And prior to, for about three hours, he fed his activists baked beans, and that's it, for about three hours. And there are laws against stink bombs, he suggests, but there are no laws against people just going through the natural processes. So it made the whole thing, you know, all the high society, highfalutin talk and everything about the symphony and the orchestra and all those things, it made it look utterly ridiculous, this kind of a, a sit-in. But there were other things like picketing at a slumlord's house, not so that you can get the slumlord to change his mind by virtue of seeing the picketers, but so his neighbors would pressure him to do this so that they wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. He also suggests that you can't do much bluffing. You can do some, but not much. And most of the time, if not virtually all the time, you have to be able to do the thing that you are saying that you're going to do. And the constant reintroduction of new issues, like we've talked about over and over again, there always has to be new issues. So there are a lot of things, you know, obviously to take from all of that, a lot of very interesting and important things and concerning things when it comes to the kinds of tactics that one might use. I think uh, going to the analysis now, this book is a step beyond the posturing. The author makes no qualms about the complete lack of principles or moral integrity. The only question is what works, how do you win? When you meet the book on that plane, there isn't much that you can fault with it. The book presupposes that you've arrived at your positions already. It's kind of more general about establishing equality and undermining the haves. You know, it doesn't talk too many specifics about, you know, what equality means and or why it's important or undermining the haves in general. But it is very specific about the ways to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. For purposes of succeeding to the exclusion of everything else, there is a lot to use here. But big picture wise, uh, we have to start thinking in terms of philosophical and psychological collateral damage. 
It's not just what do our positions mean, but what else do they mean? This kind of thing is abused, of course, but we are not just trying to win. Nobody should be chasing a Pyrrhic victory. And the better you do, the more that you can preserve. But ultimately, there's a balance. And losers don't write history books. And one thing that has bothered me tremendously is that people have differential capabilities. Just like with physical abilities, you can use that as an analogy, if not a more direct comparison. There's likely a wide spectrum when it comes to physical abilities, if you just took everybody. And people who don't exercise that muscle at all, they're going to have more difficulty using it when it comes time to use it. And especially when it comes to the brain, it could be so sluggish or unexercised that even the most slight intellectual provocation could leave them in an asthmatic heap. So what do we do with those? Is it ethical to manipulate those kinds of people to the benefit of everybody? Or do we maintain our ethical chastity? So it's a big question. Anyway, so that book obviously was a tremendous amount of fun to read, and it's tremendously explanatory uh, when it comes to the particular political situation that we are in now. I think there are a lot of Alinskyites who are out there trying to do activist work right now. And we got to realize that we're in a vacuum of motivation and meaning. So it's the best time in history to be able to manipulate a lot of people into doing a lot of political activist related things and believe a lot of absolutely ridiculous things using these kinds of tactics. So anyway, that was Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. And we are going to have some more on the next one. I know this wasn't part of the five that I said that we were reading, but I really wanted to knock this one out for election season. And hopefully it was worth it. But I will see you on the next one. All right, bye.